everyone. Hi everybody. So this is already mm -hmm. our tenth session uh, during the during the confinement, which is loosening little by little. But as you can see from the backgrounds, we're still not back in our offices, and we're all still at home. Some of us even running in. Hi, Alessandro. Good to have you. <laughs> Hi, everyone. And nice that you have recovered uh, the technical yeah, issues. Yeah, I recovered yeah. the connection. Good thing. Okay, that's a good no, start of webinar. It would be fun without uh, technical issue. I Oh no! Of course, it wouldn't be a good webinar then. You can adjust the camera so you're in the middle of the of the screen too. Pascaline de la Faye, great to have you with you from Credendo and uh, Lasse Foltmar uh, from Credit Safe. What you can figure from the the people in this uh, webinar is we're going to be talking a lot about credit management today and the solutions that are available for you. But before we do that, I want to give uh, uh, thirty seconds um, uh, to you, Caroline, to tell us a little bit about the speakers you're looking for for next webinar. Exactly. So next Friday, we are looking for a speaker who can share his expertise or her expertise about alternative payments. So feel free uh, if you know someone or if you, you want to be uh, on stage, um, you can contact me to caroline at fintechbelgium.be. And as always, so thanks for that. So everybody, please look in your network. If you're uh, knowledgeable about this subject or would like us to discuss a certain company or solution, yeah. do reach out. Uh, as always, we have the chat window where we ask you to be interactive. So don't hesitate to give feedback there. No self-promotion, but feedback on the speakers. And we're going to start with that right away. And Caroline, thank you for being the, the one putting this all together on a thank weekly you. basis. So, have a good uh, webinar. Thank you. Pascaline, you're going to tell Thank us you. about Credendo because Credendo is a global um, a player and has global information on the, the, yeah, the COVID crisis. Uh, and I really look forward to put this into perspective, uh, what's happening on the global economy. So maybe tell us a little bit about uh, Credendo yourself and the fire the presentation. Right after that, we'll have uh, Lasse from Credit Safe and we'll finish with Alessandro from Recover. So I would say, uh, Pascaline, go ahead. Thank you. Uh, let me first share uh, my presentation. Yes. Uh, please, could you please confirm that uh, when you can see my presentation? Yes, I will say so. It's uh, preparing. We have the we don't have the full view yet. We have the presentation. So if you can click at the right button, yeah, perfect. We have the full yes. view now. So go <laughs> ahead. <laughs> so thank you. Uh, let me just say a few words about Credendo. Uh, Credendo is the fourth largest credit insurance uh, company in uh, Europe. And at Credendo, we really care about uh, innovation. That, that's what we have created an innovation hub that we call AIRA42. And AIRA42 is a member of FinTech Belgium. So uh, yes. I'm very glad to be here and to represent Credendo here. So that being said, uh, what is going on on the world economy? The COVID-19 crisis has a huge impact on the global economy. We expect a uh, the, that the global uh, real GDP growth will slow down by, uh, will drop by 3% this year. If you look at the graph, you see that it's really um, a worldwide impact. That's all the world region are expected to be, uh, to post negative growth this year. It's the first time since the Great Depression that we see a sharp contraction in, in both um, uh, emerging market and advanced economy. Uh, when looking at what are the factors behind the uh, sharp slowdown in economy, it's of course all the lockdown measures taken by the government, but it's not only that, because we also see that some economies that are not or less affected by the COVID-19 are also affected and where the growth is also expected to be negative. Why it's so? It's because uh, you have various channels. Uh, the first one, uh, it's the sharp drop that we see in all the remittances. I don't know if you know what is, are the remittances, but the remittances are all... Uh, the money that the, the, the migrants send back home when they work abroad. And remittances were used to be very resilient in the past. If you look at what happened during the global financial crisis, there uh, we see that we saw that the remittances were still very resilient. It is not the case this time, and that's a, that has a huge impact on many emerging markets. So that also means that a lot of the, the migrant workers and who are who are underrepresented in many of the official numbers, of course, yes. they're heavily hit by the crisis due to the type of jobs they're doing and they cannot send the money home that they used to send home. So it has mm -hmm. like a double effect on, on other parts of the world where they're not employed, but where they're sending their money. Yes, indeed. And if you look at the impact, for instance, the World Bank ex expects that the mm -hmm. for the central um Central Asia, the drop will, be, will reach yes. almost 30 percent. So it's really a huge wow. number. Yeah. If you look at the second impact, it's really related to the tourism sector. 
uh, it's not uh, you you know with the, the lockdown measure the tourism arrival come yeah. to an halt and so many countries are hit hard the most affected countries are of, of course all the small islands in the pacific and the caribbean that are hit hard but they are not the only country that are hit hard by this sharp drop in tourism you have also other larger economies like croatia tunisia egypt to name only a few the uh, third amplification channel is really related to the sharp uh, disruption that we have seen in the supply chain but also the sharp drop in uh, global demand. And so what we see there is that the World Trade Organization expects that the global growth, uh, global trade will uh, plummet it by between nine up to uh, 30 percent. Nine percent is more in line with what we have shown during the global financial crisis. But there again, 30 percent drop in global trade would be a really a huge number just to figure out how big is this economic crisis. Uh, a fourth amplification channel is related to the commodity prices, the, notably the oil prices. All, all prices have dropped quite dramatically. Since a few weeks, they are recovering, but still the impact on all the commodity, the commodity exporters is really huge. For the commodity imported, it has a positive impact on the short term, but also a negative impact because, as I said, you have a sharp drop in remittances, sharp drop in external demand, but also all the petrodollars that are not going that are no longer going to all the emerging markets and the for the last amplification channel is really related to the sharp tightening of the global financial condition uh, what we have seen more recently is an ease in the global financial condition but for many weeks uh weak economies uh, they still don't have access to the global market and the same apply for all the uh, more risky enterprise it's very difficult for them to have access to the uh, global financial market and of course it is uh, it has also a very important impact on the global economy so uh, what uh, what can we say also is that uh, the reaction by the authority has been very important and very large a lot of government have put in place large fiscal measure the same apply for the central bank many central banks have uh, in the advanced economy we were used to quantitative easing but what is remarkable with this crisis is that uh, emerging market central bank also start to put in place asset purchases program, notably uh, the central bank of Brazil, uh, Malaysia, Indonesia, uh, Turkey, uh, China, to name only a few. The international assistance has also been very important and very rapid. If you look at the IMF, for instance, they have approved uh, they have already disbursed uh, and approved a uh, program for more than 65 countries worldwide and more are expected. The G20 has approved a debt suspension initiative that is also very welcome for all the poorest countries. But that being said, that's not enough. As I said at the beginning of my presentation, we still expect a very sharp contraction in economic activity with an increase in unemployment, more risk of bankruptcies. The public finances are also deteriorated quite dramatically. For us, that means that going forward, we can expect an higher inflation and more taxes. But for many countries also, and emerging market countries, uh, we can expect a public debt crisis. And that's clearly a worrying factor. And the balance of payment has also deteriorated quite dramatically. As I said, you have seen a sharp deterioration in uh, the tourism, in uh, commodity prices in the remittances that has a large negative impact on the current account receipt of many emerging markets. On the other hand, we have seen also a decrease in uh, import, but in many countries, the decrease in import that we have seen is not doesn't offset the sharp decrease in current account receipt. And as a result, uh, uh, we clearly see a widening of the current account uh, deficit in a context where it is very difficult to have access to uh, finance because portfolio flow come to an alt, but also if you look at foreign direct investment, uh, it's really long-term decision and there we also see a sharp decrease in foreign direct investment. So in this uh, context, what are the main risks? The main risk is are of course related to the COVID-19 pandemics. It's very difficult to predict what is uh, if we will have a new wave of um, of infection and of course if we have a new wave of infection the new trend that we see with a lockdown ease of all the lockdown measure will be reversed it is in the context of already large financial vulnerabilities and there the risk is really to see 
a new wave of bankruptcies that will lead to further unemployment, to further contraction in economic activity, that could, that could also disrupt the uh, supply chain of, uh, of uh, surviving companies, so that will have further impact and more long-term impact on the economic activity. It is in a context where the geopolitical tensions are very high. Just look at what is going on between the US and China. And there, what we expect is that the tension between China and US are there to, to say. We don't see any ease in the tension uh, going forward. It is also in a context of very high social tension. If you look at two, last year, it was really marked by a wave of protests worldwide in many continents, many uh, countries. And now, uh, if we, you look at the root cause of uh, those protests, they are very similar in many cases that are related to uh, large um, inequality, to uh, protest against corruption, or also due to the inability of at least the perception of inability of the, uh, of the government to find solution and to tackle all the socioeconomic issues. And so our expectation is clearly to see a new wave of protests going forward. And the last risk lingering on the, the world economy is, of course, all the risk related to climate change. That being said, at Credendo, we like to say that we turn uncertainties into opportunities. And we also see some opportunities uh, that are created by this crisis, opportunities for the European project, but also opportunities for the climate change. Because if you look at the uh, fiscal measures that are put in place by the authorities, they can decide to put in place a measure that favor climate friendly project. Look at what Germany said, uh, did in the program. I haven't seen any uh, support measure for the traditional car, which is, uh, if you look at car industry and automotive industry, it's a very important sector for the German economy. So it's clearly show that you can decide to put in place uh, climate friendly uh, pro uh, fiscal measure. What we are also going to see is a reshape of the global supply chain. Uh, the company are likely now to turn more to resilience, whereas in the past they were looking at more efficiency. And in this context, the big winner of this crisis is, of course, the digitalization and uh, one of the opportunities also for further expansion of the digital transformation. So I thank you for your attention. Uh, the floor. We, I would say we thank you for the gloom and doom that you have set out. So <laughs> when you said uncertainties, we know that uh, it, it, it does help to sell some of the products that you have. But uh, I, I think everybody understands the, the, I would say, the danger on a global level of uh, what has uh, yes, yeah, the whole really COVID crisis set exactly in motion. Huh? <laughs> this is not a fear, uncertainty and doubt. This is really like something we all see happening around us. And yeah, the only good thing is the opportunity for digitalization that all the fintechs have embraced and for which we will now have uh, more solutions that are being proposed maybe in a very uh, short time because you have a little bit left uh, tell us about the solutions that credendo is offering to its customers and especially to the belgian ones that, uh, that so, so, so the first solution that we are offering is of course credit insurance solution but yes. also during this uh, crisis we have expanded our product and we have really tried to uh, further support all the belgium uh, companies uh, for instance, we have uh, put in place what we call the, the bridge loan. So there we can clearly go uh, beyond what we did in the past to support and to, to put additional guarantee for the Belgium economy. It's really something that we have worked uh, on that during the crisis to, to support uh, the Belgium. And that was for existing customers or mainly for those that are exporting or for is this also something? Exporting. So we are very open to all new customers okay. also, but uh, the criteria is really to have uh, companies that are uh, active abroad. Okay, great. Thanks for the for that uh, sharing that good news too that you're now offering this sort of service as well. We had a session about that last week, and uh, it's good to see that Credendo has also uh, changed and offered a product for uh, for for that for that niche. I would say. <laughs> Is there anything else you want to add at this point, uh, Pascaline? No. Not no, then, 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 I, then I would say we're going to go uh, to uh, Lasse Feldman. Big thanks for this introduction. We'll do Q&A at the very end. Uh, so everybody, if you have questions, especially about the international aspect of the COVID crisis, we know that Pascaline is your go-to woman in this session. And uh, Lasse, I would say if you uh, want to fire up your slides and uh, Pascaline, if you want to take your down, yeah, thank you very much. Uh, so Lasse Feldmar works for CreditSafe. They offer uh, business information on a global level. 
uh, an industry <laughs> myself. <laughs> I know very well, only being limited my, with my own little startup to, to Belgium at this point in time. But so it's great to see uh, you're also a member of FinTech Belgium. And uh, yep. you're going to tell us more about uh, what credit saves, how to guarantee the business continuity in times of COVID-19. If you can also enlarge your presentation view. And then I I'm can indeed. And so, so there we go. Perfect. There you go. Can see that. Great. Well, uh, I'm uh, Lasse Faultmar, key account manager from Credit Save Belgium, as soon he said. Um, we know each other a little. Um, yeah. I'm here today to talk about uh, credit risk management uh, and more specifically, how to guarantee business continuity in times of COVID-19. To be honest, I mean, we all know that things have uh, changed. So um, we've all been impacted by this crisis. Some probably had a dream of starting a company in the beginning of this year. I know uh, a few. Uh, and most of them have actually dropped it um, or postponed out of fear for it becoming a, a nightmare. As, uh, as we all know, um, these uncertain times, you don't know, uh, we don't necessarily know when uh, shops are going open, when the economy is starting again, when people are starting to trade properly. So um, this has um, led to 15% less startups this year, which means that there's uh, less fresh meat out there. You'll have to make do with what uh, what is already in the market, the companies that are there that are trading with you. Um, and you'll... Um, You'll have to uh, to work on that. So um, the, the, the whole good news is the ones that did start must be very motivated and really thought twice uh, before yeah. making the jump. Huh? So let's hope that we saw that in previous crises, that the ones starting during a crisis do have a high likelihood to succeed because they really have everything against them. So they have no time mm -hmm. to wander on the, I would say, the fluffy details. They go straight for making money, making margins, selling. So Indeed. that's uh, trying to put a positive note here because right? it's, it's oh, worth the 15%. They're going to be the, the future last checkers. three months only. <laughs> yeah. We Go ahead, last time. We put together a few of those starters. Um, yeah. And I think they're very courageous because they, yeah. they might have started just now and uh, they don't have any positive uh, perspective. And yet they, they go for it. So uh, kudos for them, really. Um, but what it all comes down to is basically taking a risk. Um, but it's also, you know, that you have maybe less business or uh, perhaps no business and still have fixed costs, even if you start a company. Yeah. And uh, so, um, so it's a lot about the liquidity. How long can you stay afloat? And, uh, you know, either there's, uh, the, they have cash, uh, they don't, or it's running out. So uh, I would say a uh, big part of the day-to-day -day running of the company today re really is based on uh, the liquidity, the, the liquidity that's available to pay the suppliers, to pay uh, the personnel, to pay the fixed cost and so on. Um, but this is some, something that many companies don't actually have much of. Um, so there are a few governmental uh, measures to help with, uh, with this issue, but... Um, in my opinion, all it does is postpone where the problems are, or uh, at least for those who have the real issues, it won't actually solve it. So we'll probably go from a liquidity problem to a solvability problem. And as always, you'll have to make uh, choices. Uh, we all have to make choices every day. And when you do business uh, in normal times as well, you have to make choices to whom you, uh, you give credit to and who you don't, who you bet on. And uh, early on, I spoke to Caroline about uh, this poll I actually wanted to, uh, to launch now um, yeah. regarding um, how... We're doing it for you, absolutely. Which types of payments people handle. So uh, is it advanced payments? Is it cash payments? Do you give credit to customers, partial credit? Are you credit insured? I mean, all these uh, factors play a really important role in how you collaborate with your business partners. Um, so just for everybody else, we launched the poll. It's on the right top side in the tab polls. So we really look forward uh, for your answers, like what is the, the main payment message that you are currently using uh, to see how people are overcoming uh, the liquidity issues as, uh, as you've already uh, spelled out, Lasse. Uh, 
Yeah. Um, maybe using this time also, last session, we had a bit of a discussion about uh, the, the exact terms and how we're going from liquidity to solvability. Could you give us a little bit more examples? What, what exactly you count under liquidity and why it's so linked to the, sol uh, the solvability um, that comes after it? It's it's the whole it's the whole way you function the the, the, the margin you have to maneuver around. Uh, you might have peak moments uh, and need more liquidity. You you might have a, a supplier that's not so understanding that requires you an advance payment for a project that you haven't been paid for yet. So yes. the in and outs of the cash register is important. I mean, I think if we take the the restaurant business, uh, it's quite yeah. a good example of that. They haven't had any customers yes. for a while. They haven't been paid. And uh, the suppliers, uh, the guy who's going to d d deliver the lobster, he wants no risk. He wants money at delivery. Yeah. But the restaurant owner doesn't have any money because he hasn't been paid for three months. Not until Monday. So the lobster will be paid on Friday, Saturday, and the, the potential first customer enjoying that luxurious food will arrive on Monday if I'm well informed. So yeah, exactly. exactly. the good thing for the restaurateurs is the customers do pay before exiting uh, the shop, uh, the, the restaurant and the and bar. So that's the, the only good thing about the, the retail, that they don't have open invoices with their customers at the end of the day. No, but yes, indeed, it shows. It's a very good example of how liquidity uh, uh, can 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 squeeze a business before it even opens up. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So if we look at the at the poll results that came in so far, and you can keep adding your uh, your your uh, your answers to that, we do see that a lot of people still rely on cash. Forty four percent, eleven percent cash in advance, twenty two percent on credit, and twenty two percent on credit insurance. So credendo, take note. <laughs> Mm -hmm. I hope this this is uh, uh, similar to what you you see uh, in the in the general uh, Belgian uh, uh, company landscape. And I would say we, we move on lastly with your presentation. Sure, but before I do, I'll just uh, I just want to tell a little story about a uh, customer. Right. Um, I'll keep it very short. Uh, let's call her Nathalie. So um, a couple of weeks ago, Nathalie she called me and asked if I could help her identify the subcontractors that needed her the most to survive this crisis. So we talked about the data that she needed to identify the business partners. And with this data, she would uh, prioritize the projects in such a way that she would be able to help the weakest partners first and ultimately keep them afloat. And this would help her partners guarantee the business continuity and hers as well towards her customers. Um, I, I think it was quite uh, a reverse of the usual, uh, I need to protect myself against financial risk. Uh, and here, the way that uh, she approached us was uh, with a very different intention of helping those who really need that liquidity, that cash. Um, but so anyway, we need to make choices. And a company that... Um, well, as always, you know, uh, we're going to give credit. Apparently, 22% give credit. So um, you, you need to know who you're giving credit to. Uh, you need to know who you're betting on. And, and this is really the, the, the fine line when the, when the supplier is coming in and he says, okay, well, you can pay me for the lobster later, but maybe there won't be any later because the guy doesn't have any customers. Nobody's going to come and eat at his restaurant. And so the supplier doesn't get paid in the end. That's a bad bet, you know. So uh, in that sense, uh, I think um, if well, if we if we base ourselves on that, then uh, choices are very important. Um, and if um, if we look at how these choices are made based on data-driven uh, decisions. It's very important that, uh, for example, Natalie, without the data, she would have had to uh, very little to go by. Uh, and she might have had to go by a gut feeling or call uh, many of her suppliers to figure out who were in dire need. And they would probably all say, I need that project. I need that work right now. Instead, well, um, with the information that she got, she could uh, analyze, segment, prioritize uh, much faster. Uh, which obviously makes sense when uh, you have to make quick decisions is to base yourself on information, information you have, but also external information. 
I think uh, you're very well placed, uh, Tun, to to also advocate for for this. Yeah, kind we of are, we're full. Uh, agree. We all agree on data-driven decisions. The hard part nowadays is that our models are based on the past, and that's also the bias we have. And so the good models and the ones you're providing too, they use the freshest possible information, not to be biased by okay, the restaurant industry was doing like this up to March. But we know that something very drastic has happened. And so we all had to really quickly adopt our, our data-driven decision models to make sure that we add the human component to uh, the macroeconomic ones that existed in the past. And I, I guess, I don't know if you can tell us a little bit more about that, how uh, Credit Safe has, has approached this to make sure that you, you, you actually balance the, the data-driven decisions with fresh information. That, that is an, indeed a very big challenge because yeah. uh, we, we do have very accurate, up-to-date information. But as you say, well, maybe not other things have changed since March. But what yeah. we do know is that uh, by, by having identified what's going on, we've been able to come with an answer to this current crisis. An answer in our way, uh, with our approach, of course, with, uh, with our yeah. data. So, um, what we did is that we created this COVID-19 impact yes. indicator yeah. uh, to help Natalie and other customers like her identify where the current risks are. So not only the usual risks, but anything else beyond that. And this impact indicator was developed on the basis of a combination of macro and microeconomic uh, indicators, national and local data combined with payment data and other business information. So what you have here is that it assesses the, the likely disruption to a business on a simple scale from range A to E, where A is very low risk of disruption, E being a very severe impacted uh, disruption. So the vertical line indicates how much the company will be impacted by the crisis, and the horizontal line is the one that uh, is the traditional credit safe a risk score from A being the lowest risk to E being the highest risk. If um, if we break down, sorry, this um, this table here, we'll see that there's a, a distribution of all the companies, 1.7 million uh, approximately. And if we take the, the top left one, for example, that concerns at our estimate, the companies that entered the crisis with a very high risk. The basics weren't right, the financials weren't uh, right, there weren't healthy companies. They were already at risk. But they were not so, so heavily impacted by uh, the crisis. And that represents about 8% of the Belgian companies. And these, uh, these high-risk, low-impacted companies, well, you should perhaps implement stricter delivery and payment terms in order to manage better the risk. It is recommended that you always check uh, all orders before they, they're shipped. Uh, perhaps even reduce some of the activity that you have with these companies because they stay at a high risk. If we take the green part, that is the low risk, the, the low impacted companies. Uh, and, and we probably today can all find good examples of who they were uh, there were healthy, large companies, maybe the food retailers. Uh, we all know them. We know what the big brands, the uh, Colbert and so on, that weren't necessarily highly impacted uh, as everybody had to continue eating uh, and so on. That represents 67% of um, the, the companies. And these these companies, well, you should really, uh, uh, you know, try and, and focus on these and increase the business that you have with them obviously trying to maintain the conditions as much as possible. If you have advanced payment with them and so on, you should do that. The low risk and severely impacted companies uh, were the ones that entered the, the, the crisis in a healthy state, but unfortunately, well, uh, they weren't able to do much business or any at all really. Um, so, uh, so these are the ones that you should nurture because ultimately uh, they will the one be the ones that also come out of it uh, much quicker uh, as they already had some margin before entering the crisis uh, and, um, and so we'll be able to react uh, in better ways. And last but not least, you have the high risk severely impacted companies. These entered 
the crisis, sorry about that, these entered the crisis already uh, at a, maybe a breaking point. And now when they're severely impacted, haven't had any business or very little business lately. Well, uh, these 19% of the, the population of Belgian companies, 191,000 companies, well, they are uh, a big risk. In fact, you should maybe even put on hold your collaboration with them, ask advanced payments. Um, I'm, I'm not an expert in the field, but uh, uh, some in credit insurance might not even want to, to cover them. Um, so the, the, this is really the danger zone that you need to identify and, uh, and maybe modify the way that you, you work with them or work with them at all. So um, this is a bit what, what we can give, you know, our two cents on, on how to manage your, your business and who to give credit to, especially. How to, to manage, how to make the choices that you're going to make them. Based on what? Based on the fact that in the past he was always good at paying, he paid already, always on time. Well, it might not be the case anymore because he's been paying his uh, his personnel, he's been paying all the fixed costs, and his uh, liquidity has run out. So, um, so you know, if he doesn't have any business for the moment, uh, it's not the same as before the crisis. So, we really just try to to give uh, as much insight as we can, and uh, I think data-driven decisions, uh, as is proven by the pain research, uh, it's you make faster decisions and and better decisions much more frequently. So, um, so really, uh, in conclusion, you know, we're all interconnected uh, and we rely on each other. You know, one supplier can live with a customer, the customer can do his business without being supplied his, his goods or, or his services. And so in order not to fall like dominoes, we have to make the right choices. We have to make choices that protect us, but we also have to make choices that protect both our suppliers and our customers, as we're all working in this ecosystem. Uh, so better make well-informed decisions, I would say. So, um, so yeah, I mean, in, to, to really finish off, uh, in collaboration with FinTech Belgium, we've created this care package. Uh, if you want to activate it, just give me a call, send me a, a message on LinkedIn or email me. And, uh, and you can immediately go and check some of your business uh, partners. It's important that you do because uh, we're all inter interconnected. And um, the way that you will survive will affect everybody around you. That's uh, spoken mm -hmm. like, a, like a startup doing a good call to action at the end of the pitch. So thank you very much for that one, Lassa, and for offering our members uh, this extra working. advantage of keeping a close eye and uh, get data-driven decisions on their uh, suppliers uh, and, and, and customers too. So um, as I said, we'll have questions at the very end of this. Uh, so uh, if anything that is unknown to you, we'll, we'll, uh, we'll come to that. And uh, I would say with that, uh, Alessandro, uh, you are our last speaker, and then we'll go to the Q&As. Tell us a little bit more about Recover and the solutions that you are offering, which are not, uh, which are different from credit insurance, which are different from assessing the right data mm -hmm. and risks you take, uh, and which are very linked to unpaid invoices. Yeah. yeah thanks, uh, Don. Uh, yeah, indeed, in, in two words, but I will uh, I will uh, talk about, about about Recover at the end of the presentation, but. In two words, we are a credit management software that centralizes and automates every step of the debt collection process. But we'll go through this debt collection process and uh, we'll directly see how to how to improve it uh, quite quickly uh, after the presentation. So I'm gonna just start screen sharing. Okay. So, can you see? Okay, can you see my screen? If you, yeah, we see your screen now. So, if you go for the full screen view, yeah, that's it. Perfect. Okay, you see the you see the slide. Yes. We see the slide, and we see you below it. So, go ahead. Okay, perfect. So, the presentation will be uh, as stated about how to prevent late and unpaid invoices. So, we'll start with a bit of context about why credit is important and what is the impact of selling on credit. And we'll then continue on how to improve your collection, reduce your payment delay, and avoid late and unpaid invoices. 
And I will also share with you a few tips about uh, how to, that will allow you to quickly, uh, quickly improve uh, this activity at your company. So <clears throat> firstly, why, why do we need to sell on credit at all? So that's an interesting question actually, because in the end, why not only selling on cash terms? <laughs> It would be so much easier, but yeah, unfortunately, especially in B two B, not all companies are able to sell uh, to sell on cash terms. In fact, we also call the credit the the oil of commerce, so that it facilitates the exchanges and generally improves the ease of doing business. So there is this permanent trade-off between uh, improving sales by giving a more flexible payment option and delay and improving your working capital by having a stricter credit policy. So if you are the only company in your industry requesting payment on 10 days terms, while all your competitors are asking for 30, you run the risk of just not being competitive. So yeah, it means that selling on credit is unavoidable in most industries. And the drawback is that against your will, you, you become a bank. <laughs> And uh, running a bank is uh, as 99% of your of the company is not not your core business, and that's why uh, most companies are gen generally so bad at, at credit management. So, determining who to grant good credit terms or not is a matter of managing your credit risk, and the previous speaker will help you to do so. But once you have taken the decision to allow credit to your clients. At some point, you need to collect your money and make sure that you will pay it as up. And that's what we focus on on, the, on this presentation. So even though you already know at which extent inefficient credit management can be harmful for your company, here is a quick reminder. 90% of the companies are experiencing late and unpaid invoices. So basically, no one can escape it. And one third of the, the the main cause of one third of the bankruptcies is late and unpaid invoice. And in Belgium, approximately 45% of the B2B invoices are paid late. So what speaks volume about the impact is that with a 10% margin, you need to register 10,000 euro in revenues only to compensate a 1,000 euro unpaid invoice. So what could you do about it? So, Let's go to each step of the invoice life cycle. So firstly, you need good terms of sales. Those are very important because their purpose is to create uniform expectations between buyers and sellers. In this way, the terms of sales will help each party to avoid disagreement. An important cause of late payment is the uncertainty about when is due to payment or about the product and services and more generally about the commercial relationship. So if you have a clear terms of sales, you minimize the risk of contestation. And in terms of payment delay, the Belgian law fixes it to 30 days by default in B2B, but of course you're free to set uh, your own terms. I will recommend to stay a bit below the average on your industry. And Lastly, it's great to have uh, good terms of sales, but uh, you have to prove that your client uh, uh, has agreed to them in order to be able to enforce them. So if uh, your terms of sales are just high, hidden in your computer, you, you, won't, uh, you won't be able to enforce it. So I recommend that you send them as soon as possible in the beginning of the commercial relationship and that you put them publicly available on your website. And finally, put them on the backside of the, of the invoices or on the, your quotation. So uh, a last tip, if a, if a debtor has already paid an invoice with your terms on the back, then it's almost impossible for him to say that they didn't know your terms for future invoices. So it's a good thing to know. <laughs> uh, then when you, you issue your invoice, uh, it seems trivial, but when you establish your invoice, make sure that all the legal information are present and double check that every information is correct. And finally, you make sure that you send it to the right person and by the right mean. As I said, it seems trivial, but the incorrect information on the invoice is the cause of 15% 15, 15 of the late payment. That's a lot. 
And uh, yeah, in this regard, the best practice, the very best practice is to use true electronic invoices. So in UBL format, uh, it is greatly improving the processing and the payment uh, for your debtor. And no, sorry, but the PDF is not a true electronic invoice. If possible, use an invoicing software that will allow you to issue true, true electronic invoices and give the, to your debtor the possibility to have, to have a look at all these uh, outstanding invoices, have the possibility to comment them in case of, uh, yeah, in case of there is a problem with the invoice, you already know and you can identify it as soon as possible so that there is uh, any trouble causing the non-payment of the invoice. Okay, so now that the invoice is issued, you have to know whether you've been paid or not. So you could be surprised by, by this number, but even in today's FinTech era, more than 90% of the SMEs are still doing manual payment matching. Firstly, it's very time consuming. And secondly, it's, sorry, but it's very inefficient. So the proof is that 40% of the SMEs take more than 50 days only to notice that an invoice is late and 30% of them take more than 30 days. So fact is in, in debt collection, proactivity is key. The sooner you ask, the sooner you get paid. And those companies are only starting the amicable process uh, sometimes 30 to uh, 45 days later. So they greatly reduce the, the chance to collect the invoice. And even if the client pay uh, as soon as he received the first reminder, it's still 45 days later. So the best, the, the best thing I could recommend to you is to set up an automatic payment matching system so that you decrease this awareness delay to zero. So firstly, yeah, it would make you save a lot of time. And secondly, you can will be able to start your collection process as soon as possible. On Recover, for example, we do automatic payment matching for a client and in 95% of the incoming payment are, are automatically matched. So now that uh, we noticed that the invoice is late, we need to start your amicable collection. So typically it starts with reminders, classic. So, as I said previously, the sooner you ask, the sooner you get paid. So it's important that the first reminder is fired as soon as the invoice is late. There is no shame in claiming your money. Your customer got the product and the service he wanted when you want it. So now you want the counterparty, which is the payment, when you want. So that's totally normal. So a few tips about the reminders. Firstly, send no more than three reminders. If the customer hasn't reacted after three reminders, there is no point in sending a dozen. Secondly, make sure that the wording is not aggressive yet firm and that you include every essential information about the invoice and the payment. And thirdly, as for the payment before specific date, don't say as soon as possible, for example, but rather before 10th of July, for example and complete your routine reminder within first week from due date. It makes no sense to send a reminder for three months. And it's trivial, but never state first reminder because yeah, that's obvious. <laughs> so the advantage of automating your sequence of, of reminder is the fact that firstly, you save a lot of time. Secondly, you make sure that the wording is appropriate, that the debtor has always the correct info that he can immediately react on the reminder or the invoice and that the info is centralized. And lastly, it makes things less personal. So it is reversing the feeling of guilt that most entrepreneurs feel when they want to send a reminder for, for an invoice because the, it, it's reversing this feeling because if the debtor received a reminder, that's because it's late. So he should feel ashamed, not you. Then if after the series of reminders, the, the, the invoice is still late and unpaid, then it's time to send, we recommend at least to send a formal notice. So, oops, sorry. So the advantage of the formal notice is that it has a legal value. So in function of your terms of condition, 
you could stop, for example, providing the services and, and product starting from the sending of the formal notice. Also, with the formal notice, you can legitimately claim late fee. Of course, you can claim late fee before the formal notice if you have sent at least one reminder, but it depends on your terms of condition, of course. And the advantage of the formal notice is that even without planning late fee in your terms of condition, you still have the right to claim at least 40 euro in late fee plus the legal interest, which amounts to that uh, 8% uh, per year. And we, we recommend you that to plan a penalty clause in your terms of condition that amounts to uh, no more than 10% of the invoice value and uh, with a minimum of 40 euro and no more than 10% of conventional interest of course, you can put whatever you want, but still it could be cancelled by a judge in case of uh, objection. So it is recommended to send the formal notice by registered postal mail because yeah, registered email exists and they start being used, but they are not always recognized by the justice as the equivalent of the registered postal mail. So in this case, it's still better to use the good old, <laughs> the good old postal mail. Of course, you can also send it by mail to improve the reaction, the reaction delay. You will find acceptable template or formal notice in the internet or by asking your, your lawyer. But if you want to put more pressure on the debtor, you can always ask for a lawyer or, or bailiff to send, uh, to send an additional formal notice, even though it won't be free. And by the way, on Recover, you can send a formal notice by registered uh, mail in less than one click, enfin, in less than 30 seconds, late fees automatically compute and uh, you got automatically a tra tracking number of the formal, uh, the registered mail. Or you can choose to make it sent by a, by a lawyer if you want. It's done in uh, one click too. So lastly, the very last step, if nothing has been effective, is to use the legal collection. So firstly, if you have a conflict about the contract or the product and service delivered, don't go with the bailiff procedure, for example, because it's sure that we end up in justice. I would recommend to go for the mediation, which is faster and a cheaper option to avoid the legal case. And if the invoice if in, is uncontested, it's good news because it exists now in Belgium, a new procedure for the recovering of uncontested B2B invoices that is very fast and cheap. Once the bailiff summons the debtor to pay, he has one month and eight days to contest. If it doesn't, an enforcement title is issued and your debtor is just yeah, legally obliged to pay you. And the cost of the bailiff in case of non-collection is also cheaper than with traditional procedure. A, a good thing to know too is that on recover, uh, that kind of case is open less than 30 seconds and the, the B2B procedure is insured, which makes sure that makes you sure that you won't pay uh, any baby fee, even if nothing is collected. So we have covered the whole, uh, the whole process from the emission of the invoice down to the legal, um, legal collection. So a bit more of, in, of information about Recover. So we are a credit management software for SMEs that centralize and automate every step of the debt collection process from the emission of the electronic invoice, the automatic payment matching, sending of reminders, down to the lawyer and bailiff. So in average, our clients save 80% of the time spent doing debt collection or following uh, tracking invoices. And they generally reduce their payment delay from 30 to 40%, depending on the original situation, of course. So, uh, that's done for my presentation and uh, I'm gonna stop the sharing of my speed because otherwise I can't see your question, which could be uh, troublesome. So yeah. I'm Great, to... thanks for that. So we're, we're, we're gonna start. Okay. So thanks for the presentation. Uh, people will, will, will know how to find your, uh, your website to, uh, to use a of service. Course. How integrated is it with existing platforms? So uh, our client can automatically import this invoice by either using our public API, uh, importing uh, electronic invoice or CSV or PDF. And we are also linked with uh, accounting software, modern accounting software, such as Yuki, Aorus, 
and uh, there is a uh, way more to come okay great so that's uh the two apis you hook together and they, they they shoot i would say their invoices into your platform and then you take it from there that's yeah, how i understand and, and it. The, the good thing when uh for the the client that chooses our api is that they can choose when they want to send or their invoice to recover so it yeah. could be that they want to continue to do their uh, actual reminder process because they like it and yes. it's okay and then they want to send to recover only after the the reminding process and <laughs> i they can, can tell you nobody likes the reminder process uh, but we 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 are forced to do it because if you are too early with pushing too hard you lose the customer yeah and so that's uh, i understand that you you offer this balance between being a, a shark going after your your customer and it will probably be the last time they purchase or use your services and finding the right moment where you really need the extra push and step yeah, up in uh, exactly to get your money. That, that's why i said yeah. the beginning of the, of the presentation there is this constant trade-off between stricter credit rules and improving the yes. sales and you have to find the right balance you shouldn't be yeah. too harsh because otherwise yes. as you said you will penalize your sales but on the yeah. other hand if you provided the service or the product that that were promised on the contract then you've done the part of the contract so it's it's normal to claim that your customer does his part which is the payment anyway you have a lot of potential ahead of you because i launched a quick poll and asked who was using another fintech recovery reminder services and up to now only one person has clicked that option so you're 64 in this call left <laughs> So I would say you have a lot of potential uh, to, to sell to those other uh, entrepreneurs and the companies in there that are not doing this yet. So uh, thanks, Alessandro, yeah. for the great explanation on the, the, the recover service that you're offering. I would say this is the part to use the chat and the question tab uh, for our speakers. Okay. Um, I don't see any questions in there yet, so I'll, I'll, I'll use my role here to ask on the, the, the data to, I would say, both uh, to Pascaline and, and Lasse, uh, because... Um, I found it very interesting that you were telling about migrants not sending money home, but that they're doing that through alternative payment. Uh, uh, I would say uh, it's typically the uh, the Western Union uh, type of uh, companies. That means that you have their data, you have ways to get to the, the aggregated data. So uh, indeed, they, they used to... Uh, all the... We still hear you, Alessandro. So go ahead, Pascaline, you can take this yes. question. <laughs> Yeah. So, so perfect, uh, sorry. Uh, yes, indeed, they use the old payment method, but what we have seen also new trends that they also are using new payment methods that decrease the okay. cost of sending money back home. And so that's a very, it's also an opportunity that, uh, for the migrants there. Uh, but all the data that we have are mostly macroeconomic data that we, we have from uh, the IMF or from other sources. And here, what is very important is also to see what is the expectation, but we really look, and when we assess risk, and that's very much in line with what last set, we really look at what are the, the weaknesses of every country or every sector, etc. And so we have the same approach if you look at what uh, uh, last explained for the uh, how you assess credit, it's really to look at, okay, what are the weaknesses? And then to base on that, to try to see what are the latest development, to try to to predict that, and that's really the work of our uh, uh, Can you give an example of, of, of new type of services? Because I'm, I'm still hinting at our next session next Friday on the alternative payment. So not Western Union and money grant, but is there something else you saw that's being picked up uh, to send money or that you know about? I don't have. Not I okay, not, good. No, not so, not we're just curious, because just because as you <laughs> trying to make the bridge. <laughs> okay, <laughs> thanks for that. No, no, but that's okay, the trend that we see. And that has a positive impact okay. on the many and then, emerging markets. Uh, continue to question to you, Lasse. When, when it comes to the, um, the payment information, which is like the, the most real-time information you can get, uh, are you aware of partners of you that are already using the PZ2 legislation of account aggregation to give like more microeconomic or company-related uh, payment information? Is this already being used? Because it was it was really boasted as one of the new uh, ways to uh, to uh, uh, to use payment information. But I have seen very little in the field being used of that. It's still more the classical wholesale agreements between partners that are being used there. Can you share something? <coughs> it's a very good question. I um, I actually had a discussion with the with the tech company. Uh, they know who they are. <laughs> uh, and the, the interesting um, concept would be to actually grant direct access to the amount on the on the banks uh, on the bank accounts of the, the companies 
Yes. So in addition to the, the normal data that you'll find in business yeah. reports, you actually would be able to pin uh, the company that uh, you're, you're screening, ask them for the permission to have a look at their, their uh, live financial. What, how much money do you have on your account? What transactions have you done recently? What is coming in? What is going out? And that kind of transparency is actually possible yeah. today, technologically speaking. And yeah. so we, well, we have to technologically discuss. speaking, the legal framework is there. As yeah. you know, FinTech Belgium is, is, is also, uh, we're representing primarily the, the FinTechs themselves. Not all banks have already fully opened according to the standards we all hope for since September. Uh, things are improving, but uh, uh, surely, but very slowly, much slower than all of us would have wished to. But so I, I really like this example of an uh, It means that I could influence my credit rating at CreditSafe if I would open my account information to say, hey, I have a uh, hundred thousand euro on my SMB uh, bank account. I would like to share that. I know I had a shitty balance sheet last year, but we greatly improved. So can you incorporate that? So that's uh, the type of solutions that many of us accepted to uh, already had seen in 2020. And I haven't seen them being used no, at great success yet. But the legal aspects are, are, um, are there, but uh, you know, you need to implement the whole system as well. And, and then you have to actually uh, have parties, have, have companies when, they, when they're asked that they allow for other companies to have a look yeah. at the financials. Yeah, of uh, course. It's and a very sensitive we also uh, know that element. That, like so many other things, it's only momentarily. It's a, it's a, yeah. it's a spot in time. Yeah. Um, my, my, uh, my girlfriend, now my wife, we had to go to, to Denmark, live there, and there were only two conditions under which she could then actually come to that country. It was either showing a lot of money on the bank account or having a job. She didn't have a job at the moment, so she had to actually get an extract from the bank. But th that is not a real life situation. And this would be the same. You would ask uh, the company, he could quickly put loads of money on the uh, transfer uh, money on his account. And then once the snapshot has been taken, he gives it back to whoever he got it from. So it is not- but Under PZ2, there is a real-time aspect that could be taken yeah, into yeah. account. But, but yeah. that you also see, I mean, and that is the, what technology allows. It allows not only to see the saldo of the amount, but also the transactions that are going on, mm. which means that you can see whether or not that large uh, amount has been just placed there momentarily. Okay. Great. Uh, I, again, this is a call to everybody in here. We, we're going to continue for another five minutes. So uh, do use the question and chat if you have questions. If not, I'm just going to continue with mine. Uh, we'll, we'll take you last, Alexander. Uh, one back to Pascaline. Are you aware in the in the negotiations to ensure uh, credit risk at your customers that you get this sort of insights today or in the past that you could ask, like, how is your cash position? Uh, the CFO on the other side is openly sharing this with you. Um, so, for the moment, what we do is that we have a partnership with the TBI, which is a company information provider, which allows a client that wants to, to directly have the monitoring and credit risk report about the client. So, mm -hmm. so that they can, uh, on recover, assess, assess the risk uh, uh, linked to their client. Of course, they can have their own solution. Uh, that's, uh, but as we work with SMEs, that a lot of them don't have a current solution to uh, to assess the credit risk. Mm -hmm. That's uh, that's uh, convenient for them. That is already integrated on the platform. They just have to ask for it on on one click. And uh, mm -hmm. the second part of your question was about. No, that that the, was the part where uh, I was going to okay. ask Pascaline. When you do credit insurance you are in a good negotiation position to say, okay, I'm going to give you credit, but I want to get information in return. Is this something in the negotiations that you can use? And, or is it part of the, 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 I would say, the warranties or conditions that you can in, impose? But so, so when we do credit insurance, what we, we look at, we look at the debtor. So there, we, we, yeah. our clients are not our debtor. Um, quite yeah. In many cases, because if we do uh, sureties, there our clients are the debtor. But so what yeah. we look at is really, and, a large part of our portfolio is also an emerging market where it's still more difficult to have access to data. That's also one of the things that we, we have. But what we have is all the payment experience that uh, the, our customer have vis-a-vis -vis of the, the, the debtor. Yes. And that's uh, very important because 
sometimes it's a law us to see new trends uh, coming on on a specific sector on a specific country and we can compare them together so it's also a source of information but it's more based on the uh, all the invoices of our client that uh, the, the access that we can have on the uh, on the debtor uh, on the, the account of the debtors okay thanks for that um i'm i'm really looking at the question tab here that has been unused so yeah. far it's the first time it's our 10th session so this should be like an university we'd have cake and lots of questions so i'm i'm not going to stop this session before somebody is using the question tab yeah we're going to raise the pressure i i, I we're all going to take a sip of our water or whatever drink you <laughs> you took with you we want a question it's a 10th session we're not going to go without it It's okay, we can do it all night. I know you're full oh, yeah. of questions. Oh, uh, I, I, know know I don't know your problem. You never, you never run out of questions, so I'm confused. No, no, I, 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 I can go on till tonight with questions. Yeah, I, know, we, I know. We have 40 people after one hour that found this, this content interesting enough to stay tuned. I'm sure we did not answer everything. Aha, here we have the chat. Um, so we have Marino, uh, San Lorenzo, Alessandro. What do you say uh, to a fintech that tries to build internally their soft collection process? So uh, yeah. you're the external solution. What do you say to those that are building it themselves? OK, so soft collection process, I think that they mean uh, the amicable process. Uh, probably. Yes, I, I, so, I, I assume. Yes. That's yeah, <laughs> prob probably. So what do we say? What do I say to them? Well, if they can do it uh, in, a, in a nice way for the customer, why not? But if they want to use uh, the Recover API to have, a, to have a better way, then uh, they should go for it. OK, can you give us if, two? If it, this is if a good time to say a little bit about pricing. If it's yeah. a buy or build solution, people want to know, OK, if I'm going to build this, it's going to take this many man, man days. Uh, what's well, maybe the cost? Can you say something about that? Is it I a percentage, that, uh, a fixed fee, I a combination? I assume that for fintech, for example, uh, mm -hmm. the e score business, except if e score business is a uh, debt collection, in this case, okay, it becomes a competitor. So I would say just good luck. And uh, <laughs> if it's uh, if it's not if it's not the core business, then it would make more sense to uh, to just talk with them and discuss about the partnership, like we are already doing with other software, uh, just to externalize this this service. And uh, of course, let's say share the client, but I wouldn't talk about uh, how we made the partnership here in public, but of course I would encourage every uh, FinTech invoicing software or accounting software that want to, to give to their customer the possibility to improve their credit management and their debt collection to talk with us because that's an additional service that they can provide directly from their software. And uh, as I said, I think that uh, I'm more a believer in an ecosystem where everyone is focusing on this core business and everyone is interconnected in instead of uh, everyone that is trying to do the business of, uh, of, uh, of everyone. Because I firmly believe that you can't be very good at most things, but you can be excellent at a few. So that's what we chose at Recover. So, Alessandra, you're being held by Alessandra here, who is on our FinTech Belgium team. She says, if it's not your core business, it's a lot of time, money, efficiency. So uh, pick your battles She's and right. uh, I would She's say right. go for the core business. And Marino agrees with you. So I don't think he's going to be a competitor or if he's a competitor, he already agrees with your statement. So it's going to be a <laughs> kind one. Um, how long does it take to put it in place for a new company? So uh, we have Felicite who is asking that. Uh, in the actually, um, our onboarding lasts um, less than 30 minutes. We always yes. focus since the beginning of simplicity. We are not, uh, maybe Coca-Cola won't use Recover uh, tomorrow. That's possible, that's probable. But the, the focus is on the, the ease of, uh, is on the UX, the user experience the ease of using the application so that we can onboard a client in less than 30 minutes. He can already start with directly importing his already late invoices, for example, to start, and then connect the software to recover so that the rest is automatic, uh, automatically done. 
Okay, Alatar, well, thank you very much. I think you had a, a great second product pitch there to put all your features and get them in the spotlight. So this, uh, thank you for your time and all the insights. We'll, we'll move to you, Lassa, for a, a closing remark or something uh, you want to share uh, with the, the, our audience uh, to close this session. Maybe another question, I see. No. Yeah. Well, we have to wait I for it if it comes. If not, well, no, I, I mean, I said I said most of the things I had to say. I, I can keep yeah. uh, talking about my my passion, uh, my job. You know, it's uh, <laughs> maybe about that. Is this a good time for for credit rating agencies? Uh, are you yeah, say, people, because are you on the good very, side or the tough side of the sales process? <laughs> well, yes, it is. It, it is a very yeah. good time for our business, and I, I'm very fortunate to actually work for a company yeah. that's also very flexible and fast at adapting to the environment. Uh, we've always been a bit disruptor on the market, so uh, it allows us now, uh, you know, in, in a very short time to actually move 1,500 employees uh, from the offices to home working. And, and personally, uh, there's a lot more doubt out there. Doubt means that people have questions. Where, where in the past, when you do business with somebody, you would say, I, I know this customer, you know, we've, we have a good rapport. And uh, we shook hands. He made promises to me. He's going to pay me on time. He usually does, unless I deliver something that's not supposed to be delivered the way that I delivered it. And ultimately, now there's a lot more uncertainty. You haven't spoken to maybe to your customer for two weeks, two months or more. And you want to know, you want a second opinion. What are the other people saying about this guy who I used to work with all the time? When I know that his business hasn't been doing very well, will, will he be able to pay my bills at the same rate that he has in the past? Or should I just stop all credit and just ask everybody to pay cash advance? When I look at the poll, I'm quite surprised that there's quite a few who, uh, who can um, pay uh, cash advance, 35% or 12% cash and cash advance. I guess it depends on your business. Okay, mm -hmm. thanks for your closing. For the sake of time, mm -hmm. we're, we're, we're going to go for the last question and I'm going to ask uh, Pascaline if you can answer that. Can you automate the decision process on credit risk management? And uh, Kai uh, Treffers is asking that. And as a side note, I love, uh, Alessandro, you're reaching out to ION, uh, uh, a new, uh, they have a full banking license. They're asking if they can integrate your services. So FinTech Belgium is connecting the FinTechs and the banks. We really like to see that sort of innovation <laughs> happening real time, <laughs> sitting in the front row seat to see it happen. So we wish you good luck on that deal. And uh, Pascaline, if you want to give the closing <laughs> advice and the answer to the automation process. It's a very difficult question because it's really yeah. different which type of debtor. If you have a debtor where we have all the information that are available, of course, you can automate your credit process. But if you, and that's one of our specialty at Credendo, if you are their insurance uh, debtor located somewhere mm -hmm. in Africa, it's very difficult to have access to the information. And so that's where you have a balance between full automated and that's where you have to go and where you have to assess really and look at the debt or what are the positive and negative maybe you have to go there and also we are flexible at uh, credendo we 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 try to 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 offer the best solution to our clients so it's really depend on which type of, of debt i would say yes you have to go for when it is possible uh, but for if it's not possible you don't have to say no we don't assess the debt or you have to to try to find the, the most constructive solution as possible Okay. But, but anyway, it was, it was a question ask. from Kai who works at Credit Save, so uh, he wanted to please Lasse. I'm sure they have a great ultimate. <laughs> so the answer is yes if you go to Credit Save. <laughs> yes. <laughs> that was an open door. What do you do when you don't have information on debt? Yeah, that's a tough one. Indeed. And that's a so tough one. That's why I said it's yes, but when it yes. is possible. With the but, depending on the markets where they're active, and since you're mainly doing export or used to be doing exports, in also to less documented markets, very difficult to have access to uh, to uh, okay. financial information for the, the companies located yeah. in the Middle East. So. I, I would like to ask you if you can end this session on a positive note, because you opened it with the, the, the gloom and doom of everything coming down, uh, all the indicators going going to the red. Is this something positive? Look at what I said at the, the, the end of my presentation. Yes. I think that we are clearly with a lot of opportunities yeah. for, for the fintech. Uh, we have seen a huge increase in the digitalization. 
that was yes. not expected to have such use in Greece, yes. and that's really one of the opportunity for the climate. Also, the, 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 the all the fiscal measures that are put in place can really have a huge impact. If you look also at the supply chain, we can see really reshaping of the supply chain. I think that we have a lot of opportunities. Okay, thanks for giving the positive credendo closing of this session. So I want to thank uh, all three of you for the great content and presentations you. you made. I want to thank everybody who was on this session for the questions and the chat and uh, for everybody tuning in later. Next week, there's a next session on alternative payment. We still look forward to your uh, uh, suggestions there. Here's the link if you haven't uh, enrolled yet. It's again a free webinar. Uh, join us. And if you're a member of FinTech Belgium, we'd love to have you on stage. So without that, Thank you, everybody. Have a nice weekend and Thank enjoy you. the rainy weather bye -bye. during bye -bye. the listening <laughs> of the measures. Bye-bye. Everybody. Bye-bye.